And now we have left in the room only the most serious, the most dedicated, um, and people who've got absolutely nothing else to do. Um, <laughs> so welcome. I'm going to change the order slightly here um, because we have to be disruptive of alphabetical order whenever we possibly can. Um, and also to recognize that um, Mariana always gets the last word, and you may as well just give in and accept that fact. Uh, <laughs> so um, we're going to start with Bill, uh, and then go to Gordon and Alan, and then we'll finish with Mariana. Can so, I so this is Simon Willis. <laughs> uh, he used to be one of the head people in Cisco, uh, running innovation in Cisco, got very disillusioned for all the reasons that Bill talks about, of the problems in Cisco and is now, Cisco being one of the companies that spends more on share buybacks than on R&D, now he's head of the Young Foundation, Michael Young, one of the biggest social innovators of all time, and he's transforming their agenda to talk not just about social innovation, but inequality. And we're very happy to have him. Well, thanks very much, Mariana. So, um, Bill, over to you. All right, um, I'm gonna talk very quickly uh, about uh, general issues that I've been dealing with of patient capital. But then I, I want to really go through that quickly because I want to get a very concrete case that I've been looking at uh, doing to do with the Security and Exchange Commission in the United States of how the state turns from being regulatory to predatory and how that happens and the importance of economic theory, of neoclassical economic theory in allowing that to happen. So I'll get through what then, um, I want to say as a prelude uh, fairly quickly and some of you have heard this stuff and probably at other conferences and even here on, on buy, uh, stock buybacks. It's impatient finance, uh, actually impatient capital is an oxymoron that doesn't mean anything, but uh, impatient, uh, patient capital uh, is capital that is gonna stay there until it can generate the products that can generate returns. And you need to have patient capital because that process is an innovation process. It's a process that involves lots of people working together over time, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. And so you have to have some committed uh, finance there that is going to stay there from that point in time until you get the returns. Okay, now, uh, when the duration of the amount of, that of finance that's needed and the duration of time to get returns is so great, then the government steps in. Now, uh, that doesn't mean to say, and I gave some examples the other day, that the government won't be asked to step in even when that's not the case. So I would say business now is basically, as they're pumping out all this money to shareholders, they're asking the government to do what they should be doing. So it's not that everything the government does is stuff that they should be doing, but if it's properly the role of the government, it, there is a difference between government does and what business does. Uh, and business actually brings the product to market, uh, develops the product that people want to buy at prices they're willing to pay. Now, uh, the, 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 uh, in a successful business, there is actually three things they invest in. There's plant and equipment, which is often what people think is fixed, ca fixed capital. Uh, there's R&D, which of course is a current expense, but is something that has, uh, everybody realizes has a, is going to have f a future benefit. But there also is something that I call TNR. And TNR is actually part of R&D. Our R&D is part of TNR, that is training and retaining employees. Uh, co successful companies aren't companies that hire and fire every day or every week or even every year. Uh, there's reasons why even without unions, companies have keep people for careers. Uh, and the more innovative they are, uh, the more they want to train people, retain them, and, uh, and keep them there. Now at some point, under a certain set of social norms, they'll say even when those people aren't as, as needed as much as they used to be needed before, uh, they've still been loyal employees and we should uh, make sure that we take care of them. And I think that is still the case uh, 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 of a responsible company, particularly one that's generating lots of products. Okay, so, uh, and this actually is one of the most important needs for patient capital, but it's very, it's invisible. Uh, we don't even see, at least on, on U.S. Uh, financial statements, uh, the, the payroll uh, is, is never explicitly stated. And of course, those people can walk out the door. You can't put them on a balance sheet because uh, you can't have, we don't own, own people, you can't have human assets on a balance sheet. 
Uh, this is a slide uh, which just shows basically from the perspective that I'm taking of what's going on uh, at the level of the, the business enterprise, what's gone wrong with the U.S. economy, and uh, this growth in any, any income inequality that everybody's well aware of from the, the work particularly of Piketty and Says, uh, the data they've collected from the uh, uh, Internal Revenue Service. Uh, this, uh, I think Randy mentioned, this is this growing uh, gap between productivity and wages that's occurred uh, over the last 30 years. And I attribute a lot of it, not all of it obviously, but a lot of it to companies uh, stop doing this uh, training and retaining or stop being patient and basically dumping all this money out in particular in the form of buybacks to shareholders. Okay, and then I have a lot of data which shows this. This is uh, Federal Reserve flow of funds data. Uh, which shows this negative, the blue line, uh, is the uh, non-industrial companies' uh, negative net equity issue. So it averages minus $376 billion over the last decade that uh, companies are giving to the stock market rather than getting back from. That spike, that red spike is the bailout. <laughs> so that, that's why all of a sudden you have some positive e equity issues. So it has nothing to do with, with funding innovation. Uh, this is a company called FactSet, which puts out this data these data on a quarterly basis, and you can see that actually when the stock price is up, companies uh, buy more shares, they boost it up more, and then it goes down, they buy back less shares, and then now they're back on the upswing. Uh, this uh, graph, which is 251 companies uh, from, that were publicly listed from 1981 uh, to 2012, shows that stock buybacks were actually minimal uh, and almost non-existent in the beginning of the 1980s. Um, I have an article which is, uh, by some miracle coming out in Harvard Business uh, Review in about three weeks, uh, which has the title, I won't go through, uh, this is a summary actually that was written by the editor. Uh, uh, Profits without prosperity, stock buys, buybacks manipulate the market and make most Americans worse off. So this should be very uh, uh, nicely received by their main readership, which is top executives. Um, these are the Piketty and Says data. And what's important about this data, before his book came out, I was using this for a long time, Piketty's book, is that, big, that blue part at the bottom, uh, which is salaries. Uh, at least that's how it's measured uh, by them, that the biggest portion and most consistent portion of the, the, the pay, the component of the pay of the top one-tenth of one percent is salaries. Uh, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, uh, on the tax returns, it doesn't st uh, break out stock-based pay. This is a uh, chart I showed yesterday, but 80 percent or more of the uh, pay of the 500 highest paid executives come from either gains from stock options, or vesting of stock awards. Uh, Piketty, in his book, that's actually his interpretation. If you look at his book, why has, uh, 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 is that income inequality grown in the last uh, three decades? It's the salaries of, of, of people, you know, employed people. They're, they're the most numerous people in the top one-tenth of one percent, and he has this statement in his in his uh, book, and I wrote to him to see what the source was. He doesn't actually give that many sources in his book. And it's a very good paper by these people uh, who went through the same data set and looked at the occupation and industry, which you can do from the tax returns of, of people in, uh, uh, who, you know, from 1979 to 2005. Basically, here is their, uh, their graph, uh, which is about 40 percent of the top one-tenth of one percent in terms of the numbers of people are Non, uh, salaried professionals in uh, non-financial companies, another 17% are in financial companies. So this is not people who own a lot of property or necessarily even have a lot of wealth. It's people who are able to insert themselves in an organization and grab a lot out of it, as, as Mariana and I have talked about in this article we wrote on the risk-reward uh, nexus. Okay, now here's, uh, uh, I'm going to just skip over this, why stock buybacks are bad. I have a whole analysis of why they're bad at the company level, at the macroeconomy level. And I'm going to ask this question, why does the regulator of the stock market in the United States, the Security and Exchange Commission, allow it? Now, on their website, this is, it says, the investor's advocate, how the SEC protects investors, maintains market integrity, and facilitates capital formation. It doesn't do any of those things. It just does just the opposite. <laughs> and it certainly does not, you can see those numbers. It's not facilitating capital formation if you have net $376 billion a year flowing from companies to the stock market. Right? It's not doing that. And why does, why does it do it? Because in 1982, the SEC said to corporations, you can manipulate the stock market by doing massive stock buybacks. 
And it was actually in writing this article for Harvard Business Review, they asked me a number of questions. Well, why did that happen? Why did it change? And I, I looked deep, more deeply into it. And with a fellow named Ken Jacobson, we're, we're, we, we've been uh, digging deeply into this. So I'm just going to give you the essence of it. Basically, uh, there was this rule, it's called, which I'm sure almost nobody has heard of, uh, Rule 10b-18, uh, except the lawyers and corporations that know they can manipulate the stock market, uh, which, which, was, which was promulgated in uh, November of 1982 under a guy named John Shad as the SEC chairman, uh, who uh, was an advocate of deregulation. And it basically said, go and manipulate the stock market by doing large-scale buybacks. Uh, there was one article that I could find, and you know we can do these searches and be pretty exhaustive. Uh, a very good article uh, in the Wall Street Journal about how uh, about, about the the meeting at which this took place. It says SEC uh, eases the way for repurchase of stock, and the uh, subtitle is Agency assumes uh, assures it won't file charges of manipulation if, if certain rules are met. So it recognizes manipulation. There was one guy who was in this article. His name was John Evans. He was a, a Nixon appointee. He had been there for 10 years, and he said, but companies might manipulate the stock market. And Shad said, uh, no, no, it, it's better. Yeah, there might be a few cases. This is a whole, his whole line. But that's going to impede money coming into the stock market. Let's have all the activity we can have in the stock market. And regulation, you know, if there's a little bit of manipulation and fraud, who cares? This is kind of an Alan Greenspan's line, I guess, too, about financial markets. Now, uh, there's this article written just after uh, this uh, um, rule is passed uh, by two people, one who was uh, a deputy count the counsel of the Security and Exchange Commission, another former regulator. Actually, I've talked to the first guy. He's, still, he's now on Wall Street, uh, which basically said that this new rule was a, a, a regulatory about face. And so that's what we, had, we, we dug into. What was going on before this rule was passed? And here's what... Uh, we found basically there was something called Rule 13E2, uh, which had been put forward in 1969 as people who were regulators tried to say, okay, how can we stop companies from manipulating the market through open market repurchases? Now, it turns out that the SEC did not have a strong mandate to do this. It wasn't clear that they could actually do this unless they had some way of, of proving that they could be manipulating the market. Nevertheless, they put forward this thing uh, that said, you could do up to 15% of your average trading volume for the previous four weeks. Uh, four, uh, four weeks. Uh, if you did more than that, you would be charged with manipulating the market. Okay, and you had to disclose what what you had done on a daily basis. Uh, what happened was that this was replaced uh, in uh, 1982 by that rule 10b18. I'll just stay here, uh, which basically says you can uh, buy up to 25% of the average trading volume for the previous four weeks, and you won't be, ch won't be charged with manipulating the market, but that was a safe harbor. And it took a while to figure out what that meant, it was that meant there was no presumption if you did more than 25% of the average trading volume over the previous four weeks that you would be charged, and you don't have to disclose it. So nobody knows when they're actually doing this. We know when they announced the program. Now, Apple can do a one and a half billion a day without going over 25%. ExxonMobil, 300 million a day. Uh, Etc. Microsoft about 250 million a day. Now, what's interesting, and I'll just be well, two more minutes, um, is in this you can see the date here is January 19, uh, 22nd, 1981. Uh, so, if you know a little bit of American history, Reagan had now taken office, or is about to take office. I'm not sure exactly, but he had been elected, and Reagan was coming in. This guy, Harold Williams, was the was the former commissioner of the SEC, the head appointed by Carter. He wrote this article, the corporation as a continuing enterprise, and a little bit I took out from there is where he's talking about short-termism. Buybacks aren't even an issue. It's too much dividends. And he talks, it's a stakeholder argument about who corporations are run for, investing in productive capabilities. Okay, by February 1981, everything had changed. Why it had changed? Because Reagan appointed this guy, John Shad. John Shad was the first person on Wall Street to come out for Reagan. He was from a company called E.F. Hutton, which was kind of a retail brokerage. And uh, he really believed in the efficient markets hypothesis, that the more markets activity was in the markets, the better markets would function. And somehow this led to capital formation. Of course, that's not the way 
what the stock market does. It doesn't fund capital formation, it funds people trading in shares. And even when companies go public, the main reason historically why companies go public is to separate ownership control for exit, like, like an IPO and, and, and venture capitalists getting out. Well, he was a political appointee. He first person from Wall Street since Joseph Kennedy had uh, been the first commissioner in 1934, 35. And he immediately changed uh, the, the nature of regulation, or we're going from what I call from regulation to predation. Uh, and it wasn't just that he had the, uh, the, the, the ideology. One of the, the first move he made was to advocate for derivatives and for stock futures. Uh, and he did this with a guy from the Commodity uh, uh, Futures Trading Corporation. And they were trying to, who's going to do the index futures and the stock futures. That's the first thing. How do we create more financial instruments for Wall Street? Uh, and I don't know, Andy probably knows more about this, but this could have been some of the, some of the beginning of derivatives. Uh, the second thing he did, now this is really important, is he created a position that never existed before in, in a regulatory agency mainly full of lawyers who wanted to regulate business of a chief economist. And the chief economist he appointed was a guy named uh, Charles Cox. And Charles Cox was Chicago trained uh, econo economics, had written in the 70s on stock futures. He became the chief economist. Right away, anything the regulator said, they were throwing Chicago agency theory, efficient market deposit theory at, at them and saying that's all wrong. You don't understand how financial markets work. And even Chad in 1984, when there's all these mergers going on, tried to back off a bit from this and tried to say, hey, we shouldn't have many, many hostile takeovers. By that time, they had a guy named Craig Jarrell another Chicago economist uh, in, in, in that position of chief economist, he started leaking all this information uh, con uh, you know, contradicting Shad. And Shad then backed off. Okay, so Shad tried to kind of not go too far with this, he backed off. Meanwhile, they took this guy Cox, they kicked out this guy Evans, who had been the one guy who had been trying to keep the thing as a regulator among the five commissioners. They made him a commissioner and they captured this organization. And that, to, um, that is almost off. the end of the story. The last slide, it, it, which is uh, either amusing or sad, is Chad himself probably really believed what he was saying. And when he retired in 1987, after six years at the SEC, he gave Harvard Business School, where he had done an MBA, $20 million. Now, he actually wasn't all that rich. It was almost his, his whole fortune, which $20 million is, is a fair amount of money. Harvard, he gave it to them to teach business ethics because there was all this insider trading stuff with Bosky and others going on. Harvard couldn't figure out at first how to use it, but they built this very luxurious uh, uh, fitness center. It uh, cost them $18 million. I've been inside it. And it was there just for executives, to attract executives to their advanced management program. There was a lot of competition so that they could learn how to maximize shareholder value. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, Gordon. Right. Now for something completely different. I have a quandary in that I talked about some of the issues to those of you who have the stamina to stay through three days. So I don't want to repeat myself. So I will talk very briefly just to summarize a, a number of issues. Uh, this is a, it's a moronic building, certainly. <laughs> what I'm interested in is the rise the irresistible rise of venture capital as a policy instrument. And a bit like our Google speaker yesterday talked about being blessed, I, this association between God and American high-tech companies, clearly venture capitalists have been <coughs> blessed by someone up there because their influence on enterprise and innovation policy has just grown from strength to strength. And I list some of the reasons, being a high-tech building, you can't bloody well see them. But what it is, is the Silicon exemplar, Silicon Valley exemplar. Above all, that we could do this. I take here a book by Scott Shea, and as I wrote this this morning, I haven't got it here, but essentially 20% of all public companies, 11% of sales, 13% of profits, etc., etc. $2.7 trillion coming from venture capitalists making America what it is. And everyone else wants to get into that act. 
In fact, you could say this is the equivalent, but this is 50 shades of grey <laughs> for policy makers. <laughs> because it is erotic. I was trying to see this relation to being government, policy makers, and the industry. And I could only really use Rodin's The Kiss. I mean, when they're together, you have to look politely aside. <laughs> the passion that comes from this. And everyone gets involved. Our current prime minister, we aim to create the most competitive environment in the developed world for venture capital, which mirrors exactly what Tony Blair says, mirrors exactly what Gordon Brown says, and every prime minister in every country in the world, including China. We all want something of the action. And so let's forget the returns to venture capital, because that just would be embarrassing. So if we take the long-run returns to America, what you see is the zero line seems to be the most important in terms of <laughs> frequency of performance. Uh, or if we go to Britain, uh, actually minus returns, um, minus 1.3% on the 1996 vintage. Remember, that was when we had the technology uh, boom. So that's when they made all their money. But that's a detail unless you've got a pension. So let's not talk about that. So what I wanted to do was very quickly to give my impressions of someone who has been in the room to some of these discussions. And Josh Lerner, who is three above God, being at Harvard and being an American professor of venture capital, of, of, of entrepreneurship, he wrote a book called The Boulevard of Broken Dreams. And so what I'm going to talk is being a road member on the boulevard for broken dreams. I, for those of you who are British, you know, I work with the black stuff. And what I want to do is just give you some, some statements. Government innovation and finance policy makers fit into two camps. They either believe in Charles Darwin or the Book of Genesis. In reality, they believe intelligent design. The world has been created in six days, but venture capital might take a bit longer. My estimate is about 40 years, but that's a detail if you're a policymaker. But you know, because what I'm trying to say is people talk about creating a venture capital industry as though they could get it tomorrow. And that's silly. The other thing we should remember about venture capital is a magnificent instrument which is irrelevant for about 95% of all businesses that have ever been created. Again, a detail, but never mind. Two, if you believe all men are born equal, then don't become a venture capitalist. Socialists make lousy venture capitalists. What I'm trying to say here is that there is an embarrassing asymmetry or skew. Winners take all. And in that, most people end up paying, not receiving. Now, that's a bit uncomfortable here for a policymaker or even an MP from the north of England, Jutland, yeah, whatever. We'll talk about that later. Market failure is what happens when you don't give me money. A rational, objective, and rigorous economic analysis is what happens when I don't give you money. What we find, the market failure argument, is all too often the last refuge of a scoundrel or a policymaker. It is dragged out when you can't think of anything else. And what I can't actually understand, in some ways, not giving idiots money might be a market working. Because most people who start businesses shouldn't. And sometimes that is a bit of an inconvenient truth. So it's, market failure is extremely difficult to demonstrate in practice. Often there is negligible evidence of its occurrence but nonetheless used by policymakers, And very often when we talk about market failure, it's actually demand side failure. It's the quality of the entrepreneurs are not good enough to be financed. Again, an inconvenient truth. The archetypal venture capitalist has razor sharp teeth, can smell blood at three kilometers, has a paranoid psychotic need to achieve lucrative deals, reveres capital gain above all things, and likes flower arranging. <laughs> What I'm saying is, if you are going to deal with venture capitalists as government, know the nature of the beast. 
What I see is this unparalleled, unparalleled naivety in the negotiations with venture capitalists. We would like the majority of the surplus, the rent, but it is imperative that we have downside protection. I mean, it's imperative. And I've seen that argued, you know, without bursting into laughter. <laughs> but they argue it, and sometimes they get it. Venture capitalists think that C capital is very important, so long as they don't do it, so long as someone else does it. It's really important. This industry is based on seed capital, but you can't possibly expect us to do it. So what you get is an industry that is predicated on what, not patient capital, sucker capital, I, the state. Because the state, of course, can afford to lose it because we call it building infrastructure. <coughs> so there are a number of narratives. So I, 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 in the American sense, I'm sharing my pain. <laughs> so there is, just remember, there is no such thing as a fat seed capitalist. The high risk and time requirements and the small scale investment, most venture capitalists suss this out really quickly. They left like the tribes of Israel and became private equity guys. So they didn't look at anything under less than 100 million. I mean, if you look at the history of the UK and the US venture capital industry, it is a migration across to the big deals, which is the refinancing of existing assets. Very cleverly, but they are existing assets. They're not new assets, they're not innovative assets. They're just fat assets. Kleiner Perkins, Matrix, Acquire, Intel Ventures required that investors wait at least 10 years for full returns. Government and government auditors would like to see a return in three years. And it's really difficult because what you get is any venture capitalist knows that the first thing you have is a massive drain of capital out of your fund. If you're doing annual audits, that doesn't look good. And what we have often is inappropriate assessments in the short run of venture capital. It's not a quick fix. I'm nearly through. So, oh, I like this. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is my favorite, actually. Specialist buyers, I'm sorry I have to look around because I can't remember, of advanced technology products and services rarely insist that the technology they purchased was conceived, designed, and manufactured in a nomadic community of 200 persons on the north side of a field some 500 miles from Starbucks. This could be interpreted as a criticism of regional policy. Regional policy is often social policy. It should not be confused with innovation policy. Where I live, we had an RDA, the Regional Development Agency, that wanted to set up a venture capital fund. We would have led the world if sheep become entrepreneurs. Other than that, it was the most stupid place in the world to put it. But, but politicians are not necessarily cognizant of the fact of reality. I know we originally envisaged this as an early stage technology fund, but with a little money and patience, this could once again be a first class furniture factory. <laughs> This was said to me personally, and that factory was in the north of Sweden. Reindeers, snow, and rain were the normal environment. But what it shows is, oops, oh damn. All politicians believe that program objectives are elastic. This was a technology fund. But venture funds should not be a refuge for battered firms. All too often, they are when the public purse is the controller. Employment growth and protection is not a measure of VC performance. For, um, not when you're bringing in professional VCs. VCs don't care if governments have got an election in six months. What I'm saying is that we've had to go through some massive contradictions between the interests of various parties to these deals. Last thing. Downside guarantee funds do just that. They guarantee there will be a downside. Uh, there is a wonderful example, which I can't detail, in Germany, where German, German policymakers, being upset that there wasn't enough entrepreneurship, guaranteed the downside. They did it in 
a year before the biggest technology bust in living history. What that meant was if your firm was dead, you got the money back. The blood ran thick and fast throughout the whole of the German sector. It did, it really was. I mean, as, as Dreyai said to me, what could we do? We had to kill as fast as we could. We could then get 50% of our money back. You know, talk about <laughs> ununderstood consequences. Right, when I'm advising fund managers, I'm with the women from Sparta who advise their men folk, succeed or come back on your shields. I totally agree with leveraging up performance for venture capitalists in this area. I do not agree with underwriting. It completely subverts the whole purpose of using a private agent for public good. Finally, the good thing about evaluating seed and incubator funds is the cost of capital, internal rates of return. To the government, it is, unbe it is, un it is unambivalent, unambivalent, clear and simple. Unfortunately, it's also completely nonsensical. There is no way that one is going to assess and appraise rationally and logically a policy, a public policy, in terms of IRR if you're talking about early stage seed in an environment of almost complete uncertainty. We have to actually take in the externalities, we have to, we have to measure and make metrics of the social benefits and indeed Many of the, the, the programs, public programs that I've reviewed with Mark Cowling, uh, Professor Keith Cowling's son, have looked at these totality of benefits. And we can show very, very clearly that good design public venture capital works. Bad design vent public venture capital is basically a sucker looking for a venture capitalist. Here endeth the lesson. <laughs> to see there's a bit of a theme emerging. Uh, whether it will continue to emerge or will swerve in a different direction, we will now find out. Whether we go in any direction at all. Um, I'm, I, I'm very grateful to this audience. This is the Darwinian selected audience that has survived two and a half days and is still here. So um, clearly high quality on your side is guaranteed. Um, I guess my task is not to lose anyone in the next few minutes so that... <laughs> Mariana has someone to sum up too. Um, I'll keep this very short. I also don't have any PowerPoint. The, the view out of the window is actually very good. I mean, there's a lot of um, movement out there. There's even, even live building work going on, so that would be far more entertaining what I could have put on the screen. Um, and uh, I, I will eventually make a short point about... Um, <laughs> Uh, how, social, how national accounts deal with R&D. Um, it's always tempting to respond to some of the previous speakers, though. And I, I, I must admit, I got the best insights, one of the best insights I got into venture capital was um, sometime before the dot-com boom in the late 1990s, um, I heard this venture capital was saying, um, I, I get far too many applications. I get twice as many applications for funding as I could ever evaluate. So the first thing I do is I randomly throw half of them away because... <laughs> To be successful in business, I mean, you, having a good idea is necessary sometimes, but you've also got to have a tremendous amount of luck. So if I chuck half of them in the bin without reading them, the people who survive have obviously got the sort of luck that is needed <laughs> to make use of the funding I might then give them. Um, on, on the general theme of um, it's sometimes dangerous to get what you wish for, which I think is the, the, the theme I'm building up to. I mean, this, this building... Um, uh, as Kit Malthouse's comments this morning, it is very much a case. You wish for a Norman Foster building, you wish you didn't have one, which is kind of diagonal and slanted, <laughs> and, um, where uh, ha half the rooms are filled with pillars trying to keep the structure up. Um, but I, I, I guess the idea of this building is that it looks as if it's going to fall over, but never does. And I think that very much goes for my talk as well. I, I might look as if I'm about to fall down, but I hope I'll stay upright for the next five minutes. <laughs> right. That's probably true. Um, I shall inflict three. Um, the um, I, actually, I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deviating, but I'm deviating onto a worthy point. Bill managed to say a lot in his short allocated time, and um, he actually, 
I, I think gave an important explanation for something which I have been puzzling over for years, which is this: the Tobin's Q measure, the, the famous um, metric of um, companies' um, stock market valuation divided by the replacement value of their assets. Um, Tobin's Q very rarely rises above one, and this is, this is kind of puzzling because um, the efficient markets people would say, well, it should always be one. Um, but it could go above sometimes, and yet it's, it's actually, if you take out the booms, it's characteristically below one. Um, and, and the implication of that is that um, the stock market is actually telling these managers, uh, your, your company is worth less than the assets you've got, um, which is a bit embarrassing, really. Now, people used to say it's because the company's got intangible assets and the stock market somehow doesn't value those. I mean, Bill pointed out it's quite right, actually. The, the market on that one might be getting it right because the tangible assets are not owned by the company. They could walk out the door. So maybe, maybe Tobin's Q should be below one. Um, but there was some very neat work by the late Peter Bernstein looking at this, and, and he came up with um, the equally sensible interpretation that companies actually waste a lot of that. They, they, they invest, but they invest uselessly, and the market is at least able to see that some of those assets are just not going to do anything, and that's why the replacement value of the assets very rarely rises um, to the, sorry, the, the stock market valuation very rarely rises to the imputed value of, of, of the assets. Um, but it was in view of that that people used to advocate let companies buy the shares back, because if the, com if the managers are making a lot of useless investments, let's stop them doing that, let's give them give the money, make them give the money back to the shareholders, let's welcome these share buyback programs, because the money will then be reallocated brilliantly by the market, and it will actually get somewhere where it does something useful. Uh, I think Bill has very <laughs> extensively shown that these buybacks uh, don't deliver that, even if in principle they could, um, and that uh, rather questions the idea of the market being an efficient allocator. Um, but to get down to what I was actually going to say, if I got anything, uh, any time left in which to say it, um, research and development for a long time was treated as a business expense, and companies, had, uh, when they were doing the corporate accounting, were writing it off uh, as an expense in, in the year that they made the R&D spend, and in the national accounts, um, it was just a cost. Um, a lot of people um, complained about this. They said, basically, R&D is investment. We should be treating it as that. Um, it should, therefore, count towards national income because it might not be a certain process, but people are putting money into R&D with the expectation of getting a larger return from it. Um, the consumption possibility will increase later. Therefore, that is investment. Therefore, let's include that in the measure of investment for national accounts. And finally, statistical offices conceded this, and it is coming in, and there are now R&D satellites accounts, and eventually R&D is going to be treated consonantly with investment uh, as a contribution to the national income. And of course, as soon as that's done, people start wondering, should we really have done this? Was that really a good idea? Um, and there are a number of um, reasons to question whether, in fact, R&D is an investment, and we've heard some of them from this panel and from uh, earlier contributions to this conference. Um, the alarm bell that rings in my mind, if anything does, um, on hearing this is that they're going to, they're going to value the R&D using the perpetual inventory method. Um, and <laughs> it's not as if people haven't spent the last 30 or 40 years thinking of all that's wrong with the perpetual inventory method. Essentially, that's a way of valuing the capital stock, where you just add up all the past investment, adjusting it for the, uh, the upward movement caused by new investment and the downward movement caused by depreciation. And it's a very neat model, and it does enable you to come up with a calculation of today's capital stock based entirely on what's historically recorded as having been invested, subject to some rather difficult assumptions about how quickly things depreciate. Um, but it nevertheless is the ready-made method that will be used to value the R&D when it begins to go onto the national accounts. Um, and it's, it's used when companies are placing it on their balance sheet in order to smooth their earnings when they are R&D investors. Um, but the, I, I, I was originally going to run through a long list of all that is wrong with the um, 
perpetual inventory method. Um, but the, the one point I would raise about, e even if we assume it's a perfectly valid method for adding up investments and working out today's capital stock, um, the, the, the thing about depreciation is that it's not independent of the investment in the R&D. Um, in fact, what tends to cause capital to be written off is not that it's physically worn out and depreciated in that sense. It's thrown out because it's become obsolete, because there's been technical change and new capital stock is more productive. Um, and the actual, the more you invest in the R&D, the faster that obsolescence is likely to be. So there is a fundamental problem, possibly, with the way that the perpetual inventory method is going to be applied to this valuation of R&D, along with all the other problems when it's applied to investment and the capital stock. Um, so after years in which people plausibly argued we've got to capitalize R&D and therefore acknowledge its contribution to the national output, uh, now it's happening, and now I'm sure we'll have another 40 years of questioning, are we measuring it right, and are we right to measure it at all, and are we now distorting GDP upwards, because we're assuming that this will all be productive investment in R&D, when actually most of it has no results. So um, I, I think that's my little moral tale at the end. Um, a breakthrough in national accounting, but uh, one that we'll probably end up questioning for as long as it was advocated before it happened. I'll stop there, and I'll hand over to uh, what I hope will be a summing up of a, a very worthwhile conference. Okay, so I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to try to be extremely brief, literally kind of like bullet point logic of what I want to say, because I don't have time to develop any of the points. But I'm actually going to conclude, I think, with, I'm trying to think how it relates to um, Alan, but it, it probably will at some point. I'm also feeling very jet lagged, but I have no excuse, except that I had a five star hotel reservation in the hotel that most of you were at. I stupidly didn't go, because I thought I gotta go see my kids, right? Because I haven't seen them in a while. And both my twins managed to wake me up at three o'clock in the morning, and I didn't fall back asleep. <laughs> anyway, so, so this logical bullet points might start going uh, non-linear. Um, so I, I think I'm gonna end up with exactly what Gordon's and Bill's presentations were alluding that we should do, okay? And I'll start off in a way with Gordon's point, because what Gordon basically showed through all these, um, I'm not gonna use the slides because I definitely will not be able to follow them. I always want slides to follow me, but then we need a different kind of clicker. Um, so Gordon basically painted a cartoon image that we have of you know, this godlike VC industry, and that's actually how I begin my book. I begin with a cartoon image of um, the lazy Mexican, right? Which if you grew up in the US, no, I mean, I don't know, Randy, if, if, if it was all over the US, but this image of the you know, Mexican with a sombrero, palm tree, sleeping, that's, we were kind of fed this image. And I found out when I was doing my undergraduate education at Tufts, where my minor in the US, you do a major and like five minors, and you sort of come out with, at best, uh, an Italian high school degree, which is something that in Italy they should be um, fighting for today, because they're destroying it. See, I'm speaking in parentheses too. Um, it was a cartoon image which was fabricated to justify a theft. The theft of what? Basically half of Mexico, which became the US, right? So California, New Mexico, Texas, Arizona, um, during the Mexican-American War, this, you know, all of a sudden this image pops up that was perpetuated constantly of the lazy Mexican to justify that theft. How? Well, obviously Americans, North Americans, were more productive and they deserved that land. I don't want to go into the details. If you're interested in that, read the book. It's called America Ocupada from Rodolfo Acuna. And what I've basically been arguing, um, and I think other people in different ways have been arguing, is that the current uh, way that we talk about the state and in a way, the innovation ecosystem and the faults with it that um, uh, Giovanna was talking about today has been mythologizing some actors, hyping them up, making them seem godlike. And by the way, some of these actors are these SMEs, uh, which we don't have time to talk about here, but uh, Paul Nightingale has written a great paper called Muppets. What is it? Marginally underutilized, what's it called? Yeah, uh, which are SMEs, <laughs> and somehow we still throw eight billion a year at the SME population in this country, thinking that they're starving and needing this investment. Anyway, this cartoon image of you know hyping up some actors, the SMEs, the VC sector, and hyping down the state, which in the end is what this whole conference has sort of been about. Because what we've been saying is that this market failure framework, at least some of the people, this market failure framework that we have to justify what state intervention should be about, you know 
has some insights, but it's extremely limited. And I personally think, um, and I'll say it sort of strongly here, that it's not just that it's wrong, it's sort of misguided, but there's huge interests to be served by perpetuating this idea that at best, at best, you are sort of facilitating this wonderful innovation in the private sector, you are creating the conditions for innovation, you are uh, de-risking the private sector, which already we talked about yesterday why I thought that was sort of a lame way to talk about it. But if you all of a sudden say, no, actually, through all this sort of evidence, which I and, and, and Block and Bill Azonik and others have talked about, where the state has really played the lead role, not necessarily the right role, right, because this is not about normative uh, judgments about what actually happened, right, shale gas, basically 100% funded by government, so it's not necessarily good, there's a whole debate about that, but definitely the lead role in those areas that are capital intensive and have high technological and market risk, this is what I personally have meant by entrepreneurial state, which is not to mean good state, it just means the state has actually fulfilled the role way beyond the market failure notion. Um, Kaitan also was talking about, uh, about this a bit today, but this is really the state taking on the lead investment role and hence risking a shitload of taxpayer money. Because it's not just about the public good investments, they have been investments across the entire innovation chain, and as Arun told us yesterday, these are all related, right? Basic research, applied research, but also huge amounts of early stage seed financing of companies. I should show you some of the figures, but you won't be able to see them anyway because of the sun. Um, and hence taken on massive risks. So the most, you know, the latest example of this, which um, I've written about a bit, at least in the newspapers, is of course the Tesla uh, loan. It was a guaranteed loan for 465 million by Obama to that to the Tesla S car. More or less the same amount that went to Solyndra. So Solyndra was about 500 million. Um, and you know, so you know, and just like with any venture capitalist, you know, for every win you have about nine failures. But what the VC guys have is an, an ability to win, a, you know, quite a bit on the upside to fund those losses in the next round. And so it's not very easy to change that unless we actually have a different theory of where the hell all this value comes from. And this is why I think the battle is so difficult because obviously the first thing you're told is, well, wait a second, the state does get back a return tax, right? And the point there is not just what we all know, which is the tax system doesn't really work. There's huge amounts of avoidance. So Google, a company whose algorithm was funded by the state, doesn't pay tax, much tax compared to income. Uh, Apple, I've written about this, every single technology that makes that phone smart was funded by taxpayers, not just the basic research, the applied research, even the Siri thing that you can press, which never works, that was funded by the state, but for all these successes, so all these things on the iPhone, the internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, you have many, many, many failures, right? Uh, Vince Cable on the first night talked about some of the failures. He unfortunately mentioned nuclear fusion, which is what my dad has spent the last 50 years of his life doing, so. Um, but you know, that's also a question of how you obviously organize that research. Fusion is an example where today, the question is not should government be doing fusion, but the fact that all the money is around this one massive project, ITER, is something that scientists have been debating, but the point, that in order to actually play this role that we've been talking about throughout the conference, which is choosing particular directions, um, and, and Andy's point being that we should debate those directions, just like, by the way, we debate about the debt, right? What do we get told about the debt? That our grandchildren are gonna be paying the interest regardless of whether this is right or wrong. The point is, we're given this image, again, a cartoon image of our grandchildren having to pay our interest. Well, you know, if we took directionality seriously, we would, should be asking our grandchildren will be paying the price of having chosen that shale direction in the US, which today is stunting lots of investments around renewables. But because we haven't admitted this transformational catalytic role of the state, which does not mean good state, everyone always tells me I'm being folkloric, but they don't get it, this is not the point, it's not about the state being great, it's about it having a huge effect beyond that which we have admitted in this market failure theory, then we actually haven't, um, A, debated it enough, and this again came up a lot in the last session, the lunchtime one, but especially I think just have not admitted that even if we got the tax system right, it's not so obvious that that would generate the kind of returns which will be able to cover these enormous losses, which are inevitable. Now having said that, it's not just about getting the tax system right, it's also about making sure we know what's been happening to the tax system. So even if all these companies actually paid the right amount of tax, so they don't do the Apple thing of moving the subsidiary to Reno, Nevada, 
from Cupertino, where all the research is, just to you know, basically pay no tax. Um, so you don't have to talk about the third world examples or the Irish you know, examples. This happens within the US. Even if we did that, the problem is that this narrative, this cartoon image of the godlike VCs has, and Bill and I have written about this, and Bill has written plenty about other examples, has actually been the lead force that has also contributed to what's happened to tax, right? So I mentioned this yesterday. Um, was it 1976, the National Venture Capital Association started to lobby hard the US government and manage in just five years to get capital gains tax, which is one of the taxes that Piketty does focus on the most, to fall by 50%. Or the, U the, the UK Labour Party, in order to bring Silicon Valley, bring the VC industry to the UK, uh, it, was, it was under Gordon Brown, right, 2002, they got the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the time that private equity has to be invested to go down from 10 to two years to get these massive tax reductions. But most recently, this patent box policy, which both Paul, I, and, and many others who sort of know anything about innovation have been arguing against, that's a tax policy which one company, GlaxoSmithKline, in this country, uh, convinced government to introduce where if you have an airplane and just one screw is patented in that airplane, the entire income from the airplane is, accept is eligible for this massive tax reduction. What it's going to do is nothing around innovation, right? Just it's going to have a huge redistributional uh, effect. So what to do? Obviously, we should work on the tax system. We should get also governments much more courageous when they're negotiating, obviously, with companies like GlaxoSmithKline and not get them, you know, not be willing to just give in to these ridiculous stories about innovation as though innovation is led by you know, tax cuts. We know, by the way, this is work more from industry dynamics, that there's very little relationship at all between firm entry into sectors and current profit levels. Uh, Giovanni Dosi and others have found this, actually it's more Marco Vivarelli, which just suggests that what drives your investments or you know, your decision to even enter a new sector is your perception, your expectations of the future kind of growth and profit opportunities in that sector, not the existing profit level, which would you know, obviously get affected by such a massive tax cut. What drives those opportunities then is, and again, this is something we've all been writing about, or some of us, you know, these huge amounts of state financing of these very difficult areas, whether it's in health, energy, or in IT. So I just want to conclude with what to do is simply not true that it's also difficult. What's really depressing, I think, about Piketty's book is he says, well, what to do? We need a global wealth tax. Oh, but it's impossible, right? There's all sorts of things we can do. Um, Leonardo Burlamacqui, who um, in an essay, a very nice essay in that book, um, I can't remember the title of the book, Knowledge Governance talks about, you know, knowledge governance is in fact, you know, all about market shaping, um, not just market fixing, and I think you propose in that book this idea of, you know, the government therefore in its shaping of markets and the IPR um, uh, uh, distribution to actually retain some sort of golden share in those cases where the knowledge was uh, heavily financed by the public sector, which is, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, most drugs. By the way, in the Beidol Act, which was the act which allowed publicly funded research to actually be patented, this came out in 1980, it actually says in that act that, um, you know, we don't want the taxpayer to pay twice. Um, and so government should retain rights to, if you want, cap the prices of those drugs which were, you know, attributed mainly to publicly funded research. Never exercise that right. And so this is another question, even when those rights are in there, government is often too shy to sort of take action because if you're just a facilitator, of course, prices should be set by the market. Um, anyway, retaining equity, this is why I first got interested in state investment banks because there's obviously, you know, they are investment banks. This is the public sector actually retaining equity in the investments and when those returns do come back to the treasury like in Brazil and the treasury then reinvests it back into um, the economy, whether it's health, education, favelas, whatever, that gets exactly the kind of dynamic we didn't have in Silicon Valley, right? Where we socialize the risks, privatize the rewards, and a great article that's come out recently in the New Yorker, was it Gladwell? Was on what has happened to the public school system in Silicon Valley. And that's like the biggest crime, right? The, the place that's just benefited massively from all this state-funded research, and then the public school system is as dire as it is today. Anyway, income contingent loans, why not? Uh, we do it for students, why not with companies? There's a whole list of things that one could do, but the point is not necessarily, oh, that one's right, that one's wrong, but just to at least to have the debate, but by having this completely cartoon image of where value comes from, 
the risk-taking entrepreneurs, the small garage tinkers, and the kind of boring, lethargic facilitator of the state, that has been one of the lead contributors to all this value extraction. So it's not just about tax policy or even these measures, but really rethinking completely the role of these different actors and telling a much more wholesome story. And that's a huge battle, which we can do, uh, as opposed to just saying, oh, well, no wealth tax is going to be difficult.